Hi, I'm Paul McKee. I'm a cardiologist in Rochester, Minnesota. And I spend my clinical time split between the Heart Flare Clinic and our community cardiology clinic, uh, where we see a lot of patients with heart failure. And I hope to use those experiences to guide our discussion about heart failure management. And for this presentation, I have no disclosures. Here are the learning objectives that the course organizers have put together for us. We're going to first discuss pharmacology in heart failure, focusing on heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Then we'll move to a discussion about education of patients with heart failure. We'll review some of the fluid recommendations and the importance of daily weights in patients with heart failure. We'll discuss some of the strategies to avoid preventable hospitalizations in patients who were recently discharged. And then finally, we'll review indications for implantable devices in patients with heart failure. The majority of the time is going to be spent on the first objective, which is pharmacology in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So let's go ahead and get started. This is a slide that you know from Dr. Karen's presentation, looking at the ACA, ACC AHA stages of heart failure, looking at stage A, B, C, and D. For stage A patients, those are the at-risk patients. We're not going to specifically talk about management of these patients, but treatment is focused on addressing risk factors, the key risk factors being hypertension, coronary disease, and diabetes. And if you'd like, there's a very good link in the Heart Failure Society of America guidelines, which really outlines specific treatments uh, for these risk factors. Stage D, we're not going to talk about specifically either. These are patients with advanced disease. They should be referred to a heart failure specialist. We're going to spend our time focusing on stage B, which is asymptomatic heart failure, and stage C, symptomatic heart failure. So stage B, these are patients who have asymptomatic dysfunction. And why do we even care if they don't have symptoms? Well, it's based on this data that's almost 15 years old now that looks at patients who have asymptomatic LV dysfunction and compares it to patients who have normal ejection fraction and then patients who have symptomatic heart failure. The symptomatic heart failure is in the yellow, and then the green and the darker blue color are patients who have asymptomatic LV dysfunction. You can see that even despite the absence of symptoms, these patients have adverse outcomes. So it's important that we treat patients even if they lack symptoms. So for stage B heart failure, and again, by definition, these patients are all NYHA class 1, we want to use an ACE inhibitor or an ARB and a heart failure specific beta blocker. Now let's talk about ACE inhibitors or ARBs first. Uh, just an interesting aside, the first ACE inhibitor, Captopril, was developed based on the venom of the Brazilian viper. If you were bitten by this viper, you vasodilate, your blood pressure drops, um, and that ultimately led to the development of Captopril. So ACE inhibitors and ARBs have been studied in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and have been shown to improve mortality and morbidity. We generally start with an ACE inhibitor and then we transition to an ARB if there's a contraindication to ACE inhibitor therapy. The big contraindication is going to be cough with an ACE inhibitor in that situation transition quickly to an ARB. We should not use the routine combination of an ACE inhibitor ARB. They should not be used in conjunction. That's a class three indication, contraindicated. Here for your review is a list of commonly used ACE inhibitors and ARBs. There's a class effect, so you can choose any of these agents. They're equally effective in improving mortality and morbidity. I generally prefer lisinopril or enalapril, but if there is relative hypotension, often losartan is one of the less 
vasoactive compounds here. So if a patient has low blood pressure going into a titration, starting medical therapy, think about using losartan out of the gate because it generally drops the blood pressure less. Moving on to beta blockers. Like ACE inhibitors and ARBs, these medicines improve mortality. Unlike the ACE inhibitors and ARB, there's no class effect. So in heart failure, there are three preferred beta blocker agents, carvedilol, metoprolol succinate, not metoprolol tartrate, and bisoprolol. So carvedilol, metoprolol succinate, and bisoprolol are the three preferred agents in heart failure. Now there's often this question of which beta blocker to use, carvedilol versus metoprolol. Generally, carvedilol is the preferred agent when blood pressure is not a limitation. But because carvedilol inhibits both the beta and alpha receptors, it generally drops the blood pressure more than metoprolol. So if blood pressure is going to be an issue, but your blood, starting blood pressure, let's say, is 98, you're generally going to go straight to metoprolol in that person as opposed to someone who's got a systolic blood pressure of the 130s, I'll start with carvedilol. And bisoprolol is very similar to metoprolol in that it's generally less vasoactive than carvedilol. Which agent to start first, an ACE inhibitor or beta blocker? The short answer is there is no correct answer. It depends on various variables. What's the blood pressure? What's the heart rate? What's the renal function? What's the potassium? So if you've got a person with renal insufficiency, you may want to start with the beta blocker. If you're dealing with lots of PVCs or atrial fibrillation and faster heart rates, think about titrating the beta blocker first. The key point is don't titrate one class of medicines to the maximum dose at the expense of not being able to start the other class. So, for example, don't titrate carvedilol to 25 BID and then not have any blood pressure to start an ACE inhibitor or ARB. It's better to be on low or moderate doses of both agents instead of high doses of one and none of the other. So let's move to stage C, heart failure. These are patients who are symptomatic. And like stage B, heart failure, all patients should get an ACE inhibitor or ARB and a heart failure-specific beta blocker. Now, if these patients are volume overloaded, they should get diuretic therapy. And I'll spend a couple moments talking about diuretics in heart failure. This is a, a table that lists the commonly used loop diuretics, furosemide, bumetanide, torsemide, and ethocrinic acid. And I'd like to highlight one feature of this table, and that's the bioavailability. You can see that with furosemide, the bioavailability is highly variable, 10 to 100%. So patients will say, you know, gee, some days I, I take the furosemide and I urinate a lot, and some days I don't urinate at all. And that's because of the varying bioavailability. And you can contrast that with bumetanide and torsemide, where the bioavailability is very consistent, 80 to 100%. And so this is important. So one just comment, I just want to talk about dose equivalency. 40 of furosemide is equal to 20 of torsemide and 1 of bumetanide. And you can use this interchangeably. So if you're switching a patient from one agent to the other, you can use this algorithm. I think about using torsemide and bumetanide, particularly in patients who have right-sided heart failure, who have lots of ascites, who may have gut edema, because those agents are more consistently bioavailable. I only use ethocrinic acid in patients who have a documented sulfa allergy. It's very expensive, particularly the IV form that uh, can cost up to $50 per dose. So again, very expensive in the IV form. What about thiazide diuretics? Those should be used in conjunction with loop diuretics, not a standalone therapy. They can cause significant electrolyte disturbances, particularly hypokalemia. It's not uncommon for patients to be in the emergency department because their ICD has fired because their K dropped to 2 after giving metolazone without proper supplementation. So be careful when using thiazide diuretics. We generally avoid daily dosing. 
and use thiazide diuretics on an as-needed basis. I generally want to up-titrate loop diuretics first and then add PRN metolazone. If that's still not working, then think about a daily thiazide diuretic. This is an algorithm that we use in our heart failure clinic to intensify diuretic therapy in the outpatient setting. I want to highlight the first bullet point, which is to ensure adherence and excess for precipitants. I tell patients you can out-eat, you can out-drink any diuretic regimen, so I always want to first ensure that they're following a sodium restriction, they're following a fluid restriction, there's no clear precipitants like NSAID use or new anemia or new ischemia. If there's none of those, then we're going to double and then triple the daily dose of the diuretic. We're going to move to twice daily dosing. As we mentioned in the previous slides, we then transition to an alternative loop diuretic specifically moving from furosemide to torsemide and bumetanide, then add a thiazide diuretic, and then in patients who are still refractory, still have volume overload, consider outpatient IV diuresis. We'll often send patients who are outpatient infusion center, we'll give 100 or maybe even 200 of IV Lasix, watch them for a couple hours, have them come in the next day or within 48 hours for repeat lights and a, a clinical assessment. It's often a good way to prevent a hospitalization. So moving beyond diuretics and stage C heart failure, in certain patients who have reasonable renal function and acceptable potassium, we'll think about an aldosterone antagonist. And then in Patients of black descent or African Americans, we can think about using hydralazine and nitrate. So we'll talk about these two agents in more detail. The first are aldosterone antagonists. These are approved for patients who have symptomatic heart failure in an ejection fraction less than 40%. Like ACE inhibitors, like beta blockers, there's a significant improvement in mortality and morbidity and reduced hospitalization, so very effective therapies. The main problem with aldosterone antagonists is hyperkalemia. So we do not start an aldosterone antagonist if the K is already five or above. We generally recheck a potassium level three days after starting, and then weekly for one month, and then monthly for three months. That's the Heart Failure Society of America guidelines. I'm generally not as strict there, but that's the guidelines. It's important to have a protocol uh, to follow so that you can get these labs protocolized um, and followed up appropriately. In the trials that looked at using aldosterone antagonists, they included men if their creatinine was less than 2.5 and women if their creatinine was less than 2. So we can use these in patients who have some renal dysfunction. I generally start with spironolactone, and that's simply because of a cost issue. It's much less expensive than a plerinone, but spironolactone has about a 5 to 10 percent risk of gynecomastia. So if there's any signs of gynecomastia, then I quickly transition to a plerinone. Gynecomastia is generally a, 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 a temporary. It resolves with the transition, but it does take six to eight weeks to see that resolution. So start with spironolactone, then transition to a plerinone, if any, gynecomastia. Hydralazine and nitrates, these are approved. Class 1 indication for patients who are symptomatic and of African-American descent. And that's despite being on good doses of ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. In this patient population, there's a mortality benefit. For patients not of African-American descent who cannot tolerate an ACE inhibitor or ARB due to kidney dysfunction or high potassium levels, there's a class 2A indication. So it's reasonable to use in non-African-Americans, but there is not the same mortality benefit that we see in the African-American population. Moving beyond aldosterone antagonists, hydralazine and nitrates, we have a new class of therapies called ARNIs. We'll talk about those in details. Those take the place of an ACE inhibitor ARB. And then there's a Vabradine, which we'll talk about. And these are new therapies. So Sucubitril Valsartan, the brand name is Entresto. It's an ARNI. Well, what's an ARNI? ARNI is an angiotensin receptor 
neprilysin inhibitor. So it's a combination of two therapies. And in clinical trials, it was shown to be more effective than ACE inhibitors or ARBs. So this is the landmark Sucubitril-Valsartan trial, which compared Sucubitril-Valsartan to enalapril, and the primary endpoint was all-cause mortality. Included in this study were patients who had an ejection fraction less than 40%. It included patients who are NYHA class 2 to 4. I will say that NYHA class 4 was underrepresented in the study. And it included patients who had a systolic blood pressure greater than 100 despite being on guideline-directed medical therapy. And the vast majority of patients were already on good doses of an ACE inhibitor, or ARB, and a heart failure-specific beta blocker. And despite those medicines, their blood pressure was still greater than 100. There was an absolute risk reduction in mortality, about a 3% risk reduction over the study trial period, which was 27 months. And there was a similar reduction in hospitalizations, about a 3% risk reduction in hospitalizations in this trial. And based on this data, the FDA has approved Sucubitril Valsartan in patients who have an ejection fraction less than 40%. It's approved for patients who have NYHA class 2 to three symptoms. Because NYHA class 4 was underrepresented in the trial, the FDA decided not to approve in class 4 patients. Some practical tips when thinking about starting Sucubitril Valsartan. Again, think about using this in class 2 and 3 patients who are symptomatic, again, symptoms despite good doses of ACE inhibitors and heart failure specific beta blockers. We certainly want to avoid in patients who have any history of angioedema. Watch for hypotension. Again, in this trial, everyone was already on an ACE and a beta blocker and their systolic blood pressure was greater than 100. And the combination of Sucubitril um, of an ACE inhibitor, um, sorry, an ARB and an eprilysin inhibitor generally is more vasoactive and can drop the blood pressure more than just an ACE inhibitor or beta blocker alone. It's important to hold an ACE inhibitor for 36 hours before starting. Sucubitril valsartan, if a patient is on an ARB, you can start right away. Now this question often comes up, can I just start with an ARNI? Do I have to use an ACE inhibitor ARB and then transition? Well, we do have some data to answer this question. This was a small smaller, it's still a relatively large study, 800 patients, but a phase two trial that looked at starting enalapril versus sucubitril valsartan in patients who were hospitalized. And the primary endpoint was, was a biomarker endpoint. So what was the change in the NT pro BNP level? And you can see that with sucubitril valsartan, NT pro BNP dropped more than enalapril. Now there were some exploratory analyses on hard endpoints like mortality and hospital readmission. And you can see that mortality and readmission for heart failure was lower in patients who were given sucubitril valsartan as opposed to enalapril. I want to highlight that this was an eight-week study. It was not a, a multi-year study and it was not powered to look at mortality and heart failure readmissions. And for this reason, I don't think that the FDA has, in the ACC AHA, they have not included starting ARNIs right out of the gate. They still say, think about using an ACE inhibitor or ARB, and then if persistently symptomatic, systolic blood pressure is reasonable, think about transitioning to an ARNI compound. And right now, the only available ARNI compound is Sucubitril valsartan. The guidelines uh, more explicitly address this. They say, in terms of can I start directly with an ARNI, it's not currently guideline recommended. And this consensus statement published in 2017, to be explicitly clear, no predicate data supports this approach. The previous data that I showed was exploratory clinical outcomes in an eight-week study. It wasn't powered to look at hard endpoints like mortality and heart failure hospitalizations.
We certainly need longer term studies. One of the key questions that I have is that if we start with an ARNI, are we going to use all of the blood pressure that we have available for guideline directed medical therapy and we may not be able to titrate beta blockers or use aldosterone antagonists as effectively in patients who are initiated on ARNI compounds right out of the gate. So we need more data. Um, it's a promising area. I think we will get more data in the future, but right now, again, the guidelines would support starting with an ACE inhibitor, ARB, and then transitioning to Sucubitril Valsartan. What about Evabradine? So Evabradine is an interesting medication. It inhibits this current channel on the SA node, and it reduces heart rate. And it was studied in a trial called the SHIFT trial, which is now 10 years old, and it showed that it reduced heart failure-related admissions. This was among patients who had a reduced ejection fraction. Importantly, they were in sinus rhythm because it acts on the SA node. There was no mortality benefit with Evabradine. Despite the lack of mortality benefit, because of the reduction in hospitalizations, it was FDA approved in 2015. It has a class 2A indication in the 2016 heart failure guidelines. Now, some practical tips on how to use Evabradine. I very rarely use Evabradine. Um, because uh, it's expensive, we already have multiple guideline-directed medical therapies, um, and rarely are, do I have patients whose resting heart rate is greater than 70 despite maximally tolerated medical therapy. So you want to first ensure that patients are on maximally tolerated guideline-directed medical therapy. You generally start with 5 milligrams and then you titrate based on heart rate in two weeks. Key points you want to avoid in patients who have atrial fibrillation because it works on the SA node. If a person's in atrial fibrillation, it's not going to be um, beneficial. The same thing with patients who are pacemaker dependent. Um, it's cleared uh, hepatically, so we should avoid in patients who have hepatic impairment. One comment about digoxin. Digoxin is a medicine that, in effect, is very similar to Evabradine. Um, it lowers the heart rate. Um, it's shown to reduce heart failure-related hospitalizations, but does not have an impact on mortality. I generally consider using digoxin in patients who have suboptimal heart rate control despite maximally tolerated beta blocker therapy. So in patients with AFib who have fast heart rates, who I can't use higher doses of beta blocker, I'll think about using digoxin for rate control. And generally, we want to aim for a level of 0 0.5 to 0 0.9. So we have so many different medicines to use in heart failure. Guideline-directed medical therapy is we have an abundance of riches here. So how do we decide how to prioritize therapy here? And there's no specific a right or wrong answer, but this is some data that I use in my clinical practice to help guide how I prioritize which therapies to use. So this is the number needed to treat to save one life, and it's standardized over a time period of 36 months. So if we look at ACE inhibitors, the number needed to treat to save one person's life is 26, beta blocker is 9, aldosterone antagonist is 6, Hydralazine nitrates in African Americans is seven. Now, Sucubitril valsartan compared to an imputed placebo, it's never been actually compared to a placebo, but using experimental models, the number needed to treat is about 15. And then incrementally beneficial to ACE inhibitor therapy, the number needed to treat is 29. Now, what about the cost of these medicines? So for ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, aldosterone antagonists, the cost is about 50 bucks a year. For hydralazine and nitrates, the cost is about $500 a year. And for Sucubitril valsartan, the cost is about $5,000 per year. So certainly cost should not be the only factor that plays into our decisions about using which medical therapy to use, but it does 
impact how I generally approach patients who have a reduced ejection fraction. I generally think about ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, aldosterone antagonists first. If the ejection fraction is still reduced, if a patient is still symptomatic, then I review transitioning the ACE inhibitor to Secubitril Valsartan. Now, we talked about how effective these medicines are. The problem is that they are underutilized. This is a data that looks at percentage of patients receiving specific guideline-directed medical therapy. So ACE inhibitors, ARBs, 80%, beta blockers, about 55%, aldosterone antagonists, 30%. And then if we look at the patients who are receiving adequate doses or target doses of these therapies, we're not doing a very good job. Only 60, sorry, 35% of patients receiving target doses of an ACE or an ARB if they're on it, and then 20% of patients are on target doses of a beta blocker. So here are some tips that I use in my practice to help optimize guideline-directed medical therapy. I always tell patients that this is a slow process. It's a marathon. It is not a sprint. These medicines are effective over months and years. They're not going to be effective over days and weeks. And we have a protocol where we increase guideline-directed medical therapy in small increments every one to two weeks. For example, we might go up on carvedilol in 3.125 milligram increments every two weeks until we achieve goal doses. The same with lisinopril, 5 milligram increments every two weeks. Spironolactone, 12 to 25 in a two-week increments. I tolerate asymptomatic hypotension. Almost everyone who takes these medicines is going to have some hypotension. The question is, are they symptomatic or not? I tell patients, if you can stand, think, and pee, I don't really care what your blood pressure is. We know that there's mortality benefit to being on these medicines. Our protocol says if your systolic blood pressure is greater than 80, we are going to move up, we're going to titrate up guideline-directed medical therapy as long as you're asymptomatic. As we get on better guideline-directed medical therapy, there's positive remodeling of the heart. The ejection fraction may improve, cardiac output may improve, and diuretic requirements may go down. So if you're struggling with hypotension and a patient is euvolemic, think about backing off their diuretics first as opposed to backing off other guideline-directed medical therapy with mortality benefit. Treat the patient, not the creatinine. There's going to be a bump in the creatinine. Tolerate a 30% decrease in GFR. These medicines have mortality benefit, tolerate small jumps in the creatinine. You're trading that for mortality benefit. I can't emphasize this enough. Wait three to six months after med optimization before rechecking the ejection fraction to see if a patient is a candidate for device therapy. We'll talk about this in a, later in the presentation, but it's not okay to put a patient on a low dose of a beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor at the diagnosis, then recheck an echo in three months, and then say, hey, the EF didn't get better. Now I'm going to put a device in. You need to optimize that person on medical therapy after the last dose adjustment, then wait three months and check the echo, see what their EF is, and then make a decision about device therapy. I always share the Seattle heart failure model with patients, and that's to help promote buy-in with medical therapy. They're going to have side effects, but I really want to highlight why we're using these medicines so that they're more likely to take them. So this is just an example, a patient at baseline who has an average life expectancy of 4.3 years, then you add in medical therapy and their life expectancy increases to nine years. I think when patients see this, they're much more likely to tolerate some of the side effects of these medications because they're going to get mortality benefit. Now, all the medicines we just talked about are for patients who have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. What about guideline-directed medical therapy for patients who have a preserved ejection fraction? Well, the short answer is that all the neurohumoral antagonists that are effective in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, they fail in preserved ejection fraction. In preserved ejection fraction, all of these lines cross 1.0, meaning they are not statistically beneficial in patients who have 
a reduced ejection fraction. So what therapies do we have for the treatment of heart failure with preserved EF? Well, again, as we mentioned, therapies targeting neurohumoral activation are ineffective. The one possible exception is an aldosterone antagonist, so spironolactone may be helpful in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, so think about using that in select patients. Obviously, if a patient is volume up, we should use diuretics, we should dry them out. Exercise training and weight loss have been shown to be very effective, but unfortunately, we don't have good therapies for heart failure with preserved EF, and so prevention is critical. We should be focusing on those risk factors that we know are associated with heart failure with preserved EF, diabetes, obesity, coronary disease, hypertension, sleep apnea, Prevention is critical because, unfortunately, we don't have good therapies. So now let's move to a discussion about some of the education um, of patients who have heart failure. We'll also talk about uh, fluid recommendations and daily weights, as well as some strategies to prevent hospitalizations or readmissions in patients who are recently discharged. <clears throat> In every patient who has a diagnosis of heart failure, either reduced or preserved EF, it's important to provide good education on lifestyle interventions. And the biggest lifestyle interventions, sodium restriction and fluid restriction. And generally, we want to aim for about 2 grams of sodium or less per day. The general recommendation for fluids is two liters or less. Sometimes it's more strict depending on a patient or less strict. Um, so 1.5 to 3 liters is generally the range that I focus on. Now when talking to patients about sodium restriction or with the come in fluid overloaded, almost everyone says, geez, I, you know, I'm following a low sodium diet. But I generally don't even ask that question. I ask what they had for dinner last night. What did you have for lunch yesterday? And what you'll find is people are following a low sodium diet, quote unquote, but they're eating very high sodium foods. And that's because there's so much sodium in processed foods or they're eating out and they're unaware of the sodium content. There are lots of literature that can help guide patients through eating out and, and buying processed foods. Generally, we try to avoid that. This is one book that we use in our clinic that really has the sodium content of almost any restaurant uh, that you can imagine in the food. It's quite shocking how much sodium is in the food. But again, education on sodium and fluid restriction is critical. Alcohol should be, abstinence is ideal. If absence is not a possibility, try to limit it to less than two drinks per week. I always use decompensations as an opportunity to provide additional education. Um, sometimes it just doesn't sink in until one or two decompensations have occurred, the importance of sodium and fluid restriction. And because patients, they eat their meals with caregivers and family members, it's important to incorporate those individuals who they live with into these discussions. They can help keep a patient out of trouble by guiding and adjusting the type of foods that they're eating. Daily weights are super important. Uh, we generally want to take those first thing in the morning, same time of day, same type of clothing for consistency. Um, the question is, what do you do about those weights? It's one thing to check your weights and then not do anything about it, but there should be a plan in place should the weights increase. And I always want to empower the patient and their family to adjust diuretics on their own. So I always give a, a patient a diuretic plan, and that's really focused on doubling loop diuretics for two or three days until weight normalizes. So I say if your weight's above two to three pounds above your dry weight, double your diuretics until you're back to your dry weight. I also, I mean, I tell patients that if your weight's up five pounds, we can usually manage that as an outpatient. If it's 10 pounds, maybe we can manage that as an outpatient. If it's 15 pounds, geez, uh, that's going to require hospitalization. So empower the patient to increase their diuretics, but they also need a phone number to call should they not respond to higher dose diuretics. <clears throat> 
What about telemonitoring? There's an abundance of all sorts of devices that can help monitor um, weights and blood pressures and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, those have not been shown to be effective in reducing admissions. So um, generally, we do not recommend these. Now, they can be helpful in certain situations, but in general, they do not reduce hospitalizations. Exercise training is very helpful. Medicare now approves for cardiac rehab in patients who have a reduced ejection fraction. Unfortunately, they don't approve. It's not approved for patients who have a preserved ejection fraction. And you can see the specific requirements here, symptoms despite optimal medical therapy for at least six weeks. And ultimately, the goal is 30 minutes, five days per week of exercise. What about some tips for reducing readmission? This is a tough area, and it's really challenging. And part of the challenge is that half of readmissions for, heart, for patients who have heart failure are for non-heart failure-related conditions. So they get readmitted for COPD or renal failure. They have a fall. So it's really, really a challenging uh, problem to address. How do we reduce readmission rates in patients who have heart failure? I will say the guideline-directed medical therapy, all the therapies that we talked about earlier, are, have significant, can significantly reduce readmission rates, so that should be employed in all patients. Unfortunately, there's a lack of evidence for other really good interventions to improve readmission rates. With the one exception is that a patient who has a follow-up within seven days of their discharge is less likely to be readmitted in the next 30 days. So close follow-up is critical. So within seven days of follow-up. And the more multidisciplinary that follow-up is, if there's a nurse-led intervention that includes education with the patient, the family, reviewing of medicines, and then a phone number to call up if there's, if, if there's problems, that can also reduce hospitalizations. I won't talk about CardioMEMS in detail here, but know that a CardioMEMS, which is a device that can monitor pressures inside the, the heart, the PA pressures, has been shown to reduce hospitalizations. And CRT, which we'll talk about in the next few slides, can also reduce hospitalizations. This is a very challenging topic. Again, I want to highlight that the more multidisciplinary your team is because of the complex comorbid conditions that these patients have, the less likely they are to be readmitted. So we'll move to our final learning objective, which is to talk about implantable devices in patients with heart failure. We'll first talk about ICD therapy, and this is in non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. In patients who are on guideline-directed medical therapy for at least three months, and again, I really want to highlight that they have been on guideline-directed medical therapy, and I would say optimal guideline-directed medical therapy for at least three months. If the patient is class 2 to 3 and their EF is less than 35%, then there's a class 1 indication for ICD therapy. If they're less symptomatic, it's reasonable to think about an ICD therapy, but the data is not as supportive. But again, I want to highlight that these patients should be on optimal guideline-directed medical therapy. There's some caveats about non-ischemic cardiomyopathy really based on this Danish trial that was published in 2016. This was a trial that compared ICD plus best medical therapy to best medical therapy and no ICD. And there was no improvement in the primary endpoint, which was death from any cause. Having said that, when we look at meta-analysis of all the trials with non-ischemic cardiomyopathies, there's an overall benefit, and the guidelines still support the use of an ICD in non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. What about ICD therapy in ischemic cardiomyopathies? Similar to non-ischemics, there's a criteria that we need to wait 90 days post-revascularization or greater than 40 days after an MI without revascularization. And you can see the specific criteria here. Um, I won't go through these in detail, but know that if the ejection fraction is reduced and you have symptoms, you meet criteria. If the ejection fraction is a little bit higher, let's say less than 40%, but you have VT, 
then that's a class one indication. We generally don't recommend ICD therapy in class four patients, but if you're being considered for transplant or an LVAD, then it's a reasonable decision. What about wearable device? And these are generally offered in patients who have a diagnosis, but don't yet meet criteria for an implantable defibrillator. These were studied uh, in a big trial that showed no improvement in all-cause mortality or sudden cardiac death with life vest therapy. But the caveat is that you have to wear it for to work. And of the patients in the device group who died, only 12 were wearing the device when they died. And if you look at intention to a treat analysis, patients who were actually wearing the device got benefit. So the guidelines say that it's a reasonable to think about using a wearable cardio defibrillator in patients who don't yet meet criteria for an ICD. Now finally, we'll talk about CRT, chronic resynchronization therapy. This has been shown to improve quality of life, reduce hospitalizations, and improve mortality. It leads to beneficial or positive remodeling of the heart, so the LV size decreases, the ejection fraction improves. And I just want to make it a, an important point about the response to CRT. It's not universal. Not everyone's going to get benefit. About a third of patients are not going to get benefit from CRT. About two-thirds are going to get some benefit from CRT therapy. Here is a busy slide that talks about indications for CRT, which patients to think about. I want to highlight that if you have a left bundle branch block, and your QRS is greater than 150, it's a no-brainer. So left bundle branch blocks, wide QRS, those patients get benefit. Narrower QRSs, non-left bundle branch morphologies have less benefit, but as patients get sicker, the guidelines generally allow for placement of a CRT. And similar to ICD therapy, we want to wait 90 days after guideline-directed medical therapy, and I would op uh, suggest optimal guideline-directed medical therapy. And again, there's the caveats for revascularization and myocardial infarction. So we've gone through our learning objectives. I want to just highlight some take-home points. The first is that Guideline-directed therapy is effective, but it's underutilized. These medicines improve mortality, they improve morbidity, they reduce hospitalizations, but they're just not used that often. So it's important to always think about how you're going to optimize patients on these medicines. What protocols do you have? How are you going to use your nurses? How are you going to see patients back to optimize these medicines? Non-pharmacologic treatment is focused on sodium and fluid restriction. Remember that patients can out-eat or out-drink any diuretic regimen, and a multidisciplinary approach to education, incorporating your nursing and, um, and literature uh, can be very helpful in reducing decompensations. Device therapy is beneficial, but always remember optimize guideline-directed medical therapy first. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time, and feel free to reach out with any questions or comments, and again, thank you.